morning. I don't know if Don shared or not, but um, Josh is off suffering for Jesus uh, on a cruise. Um, <laughs> he tries to make it a spiritual event, but it's a cruise is what it is. Um, something that he does with a group of uh, individuals every year, they go off and uh, spend a, about 10 days together and they study the word and have a lot of fun and do various things like cruises. And so um, please pray for him. Claire's with them, Sarah's with them. So uh, some of our music team are, are gone this morning, but we uh, thank the crew that was up here this morning for our lead us in those songs. I love those songs. Um, I, uh, you know, as I've reflected back over the last three weeks, I, I just uh, was, I was just touched in my soul by the music, the Christmas music. I think that as the years go by, you know, we've sung songs and you kind of get used to singing them and many times you don't pay a lot of attention to the words, at least I don't, if I know a song really well. But uh, the, the, the Christmas music really was very touching to me this year. Um, what Josh did is he picked out about, I think he had eight or nine songs that he, he did on Sunday mornings and at the Christmas Eve service and at the praise night. And uh, it was really fun to hear some of the songs being sung several times and getting to sing along with them. And so just as I look back over this Christmas season, I just go away with that, just how the Lord uh, used that in, in my own life, once again reflecting on this one who came. I think reading the gospel, I, I've been reading, uh, you know, sometimes when you want to read through the Bible in a chronological or historical order, you, you use the daily Bible. That's what uh, uh, Mary Lee and myself use. And I've just been reading the Gospels, and I am so touched by this, uh, by this Jesus, this biblical Jesus that's described in the Bible. And it talks about him before he even came to earth. You know, again, it's really fun to think about that, that Jesus has always existed and this is what he was. And one of the phrases I like in John's gospel, John chapter one, is that he was, he was, he's always been shining. We think, well, he was the light of the world when he came to, uh, to this earth and became flesh and dwelt among us for a while. But, but he's always been shining, always, always giving people opportunities to get to know him and his truth. And so... Uh, I just, um, Christmas for us was very special. We had a special time as a family, and um, it was just really good. And now we're in, we're 2020. Several of us who are a little bit older have been remarking, it seemed like a Y2K was just yesterday. And uh, yeah, 20 years ago yesterday it was. But uh, it's just been, uh, you know, it's been quite a, a quite a time for, for us, and, and during the next four weeks, we're going to be looking, we're going to be looking on Sunday mornings at uh, Romans chapter 9, and if you want to turn there, well, actually, we're going to start in Luke 15, so if you want to turn to Luke 15, you can do that, but j just kind of let me tell you where we're, where we're going here. Um, I, I think Romans chapter 9 has been very misunderstood by a lot of Christians. Um, and, I'm, I'm, I, you know, my, my goal whenever I teach God's Word is always to teach it in the context in which it was written. And if you just, if you read, you know, if you just continue, you know, you're reading Romans 5, 6, 7, 8, just continue right on. Don't, don't look like there's a shift there or anything. Just continue right on. It's conti Paul is continuing to write this wonderful uh, uh, message. And I, I just um, pray that we understand it in the context in which it was written this letter that Paul wrote to the Roman Christians. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing on Sunday mornings. The other thing I'd like to be doing on the next four Sunday mornings is kind of give you the basis for our ministry here through the years and really the basis for my own life, uh, my walk with the Lord. And so we're going to be kind of looking at a couple of things every, every week here during this month. Um, one of the things that we're going to be looking at are, are what we are looking at on Tuesday nights, the discipleship, you know, what we call the keys to discipleship is going to continue on uh, 
this Tuesday evening, we're starting here. We meet back in the back room at 6.30. If you'd like to come, we meet back for about an hour and a half. Um, but but uh, we'd love for you to uh, join us on that. If you haven't been part of that, you can, you'll fit right in. If you'd like to join us on Tuesday nights, Friday morning men's group, we will continue doing what we're doing. We've been going through our messages there. But I, I just for the next four weeks, I would like to... Um, um, just cover the new covenant. I'd like to cover your spiritual identity, our spiritual identity, how to walk as the Christians we are, how to study the Bible, um, you know, in the sense of, of oh, why, do, why do we, why are we known as a teaching church? And it's because God has written, had his word written. He inspired writers to write his word that give us answers to life. And so we're going we're gonna to cover that probably the fourth week that I'm going through this. But I just, uh, it's been really good for me to be refreshed in those areas and say, okay, what is, you know, what's been the basis for this ministry and will continue to be the basis for this ministry as we uh, enter a new, you know, a new year here. And so um, t- today I'm going to include, I'm going to include, uh, um, the new covenant ministry that we uh, that we have, and and uh, but I'm going to cover it during my message, so it's going to kind of be a combination this week. It won't always be that. So, Father, thank you, <laughs> thank you for the privilege of gathering together, uh, of sharing the one life of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is our head, and we are His body. We are His family. God, you are our Father. We thank you for the oneness that we share. And as we enter into 2020, (laughs) um, as we enter into this year, may it be obvious that we are growing. May it be obvious that we are, um, that we love you with all of our hearts, souls, and mind, and strength. May it be obvious that you are the center of our lives. May our conversation revolve around you and what you've revealed in your word. I just pray that there would not, I know it's so easy to get caught up in all the the political things and the world event things and all those things. I know it's really easy to get caught up in those things. Maybe something personal going on in our families. Um, But I pray that our subject, our main subject for the year, is you. And so thank you for giving us your word. You, you inspired these writers long ago to write what, you, what we needed, what you wanted us to have. And so we thank you that we can go to that with great confidence and we can go away resting in you and finding in you everything we need, no matter what our situations are in life. So um, thank you for being the God that you are. And um, thank you that we have the privilege of knowing you. And I pray that we would know you better. And I pray that we would look at others around us and realize if they aren't Christians, they need you too. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. In Luke chapter 15, it's an interesting passage, especially in the context in which it was written. Jesus is just, um, these large crowds were going with Jesus and his disciples are there. And, and um, Jesus all of a sudden starts teaching and he says in chapter, chapter 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then later on, he says, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own, her own possessions. And you'd think that that would cause people to, man, if Jesus has to be first of all my family and my possessions and even my own life, 
you'd think that that would kind of scare them away. But look at the response that you get in chapter 15, verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to him. This was a very attractive offer that Jesus was making. That when Jesus is first, you're going to find you love your family more than you ever loved them if he's, if he's not first. If you put him in front of your own life and your desires and your goals and your dreams and all the other things about you, uh, if, you put him, if, if you put him first, you're going to find life is more abundant in terms of living. And if you put him and realize that any possession we have belongs to him, it doesn't belong to us, we are simply stewards of that. So if we put the right order on our possessions, then we will use them in a wise way, ways that are honoring to him. And these people, these sinners and tax collectors, tax collectors were looked at as um, not quite the same as today, Probably there are a lot of similarities. Uh, but, but, uh, but they were looked at as traitors. You, you had these Jews who were collecting taxes for the Romans, so the Jews didn't like them, and the Romans were simply exploiting them and using them. And, and so nobody liked the tax collectors. And yet it was the sinners and the tax collectors who realized their need for Jesus. And then you look at the other response the, from the religious leaders in verse 2, both the Pharisees, those were people who were separate from other, if you, didn't, if, you didn't, if you weren't following all their rules and regulations, hundreds, maybe even thousands of rules and regulations, they, they were separate from all of the rest of society if you weren't part of their group. It's actually a rather small group, but they had a... a you know, they had a lot of power. Both the Pharisees and the scribes, those were the religious lawyers who, who knew uh, the Old Testament and the, uh, really well, and they knew all the traditions of the rabbis. And so you have both the Pharisees and the scribes, they began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Those people would never have associated with sinners. They didn't want them part of their group. And so in verse 3, it says in Luke 15 there, so he told, so Jesus told them this parable saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it, it's beautiful, beautiful picture here. When he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. They didn't realize their need. Verse 8, or, or what woman, if she has 10 silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I've had the privilege of being involved in sharing the Lord Jesus with a lot of people through the years. And I've been in, you know, I, I happen to be involved when some of those individuals made the decision to repent and turn to Jesus as Lord. And one of the first things I tell them, do you know that the angels in heaven are rejoicing? <laughs> they are. Let's join the party. And so you, as you read these verses, and as we get into Romans chapter 9, if you want to turn to there, there with me. In 
If you're lost, Jesus is coming after you. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And those people that Jesus was talking to, those sinners and tax collectors, realized that. Jesus was coming after him. He loved them. He was willing to give his life for them. And if you're lost and you realize it, Jesus is coming after you out of love. And what we're going to see in Romans chapter 9, actually you see it in all three chapters, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. God has a choice to make, and God chooses mercy. Can God do anything he wants? Of course he can. He's our creator. But it's going to be obvious as you go through all three of these chapters, but especially as we go through chapter 9, that God chose mercy. He didn't have to choose that, but he made the choice to. The other thing we're going to see that you see in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 is Israel had a choice to make. The nation of Israel had a choice to make, and they chose unbelief. They didn't choose to trust this merciful God. They had advantages, opportunities that we can't even possibly imagine. But when they had the choice, when they had to make the choice, they chose to not trust God. And we're going to find that we have a choice here, that every person has a choice. And what are you going to choose? I pray that your choice is based upon the, this one that is talked about in the scripture, this merciful God. Get to know this Jesus. <laughs> we would have considered those words that he said, you know, rather harsh if you were a religious leader and you heard those words. And, you know, but, but the lost didn't find that at all. They thought I was really attractive. Somebody will be Lord of my life. I need a Lord of my life. I need this person who loves me and who, who, who are, and I'm going to experience life as it was intended to be lived if I follow him as Lord. And you look at this nation of Israel and even though Jesus came to save them from their sins, remember, that's what the angel told Joseph, this, this one, you need to name him Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. And so Jesus came after them, the nation of Israel, to save them from their sins, but the Old Testament nation of Israel rejected him. As they had been doing, rejecting God for hundreds of years. And we see the end, at the end of this chapter, chapter 9, the reason for Israel's rejection is because they didn't pursue God or Jesus by faith. They pursued him according to their own laws and rules and regulations, they tried to get right with God or thought they were right with God because of their works or because of their ancestry or because of their religious rituals. But we need to understand, and this has been true from the very beginning of creation, that only faith is pleasing to God. If you were a religious Jew and you would read Romans chapters 1 through 8, that, that would be devastating for you. Because they were counting on their ancestry. They were counting on keeping the law. They, they were counting on their rituals. They didn't see their need. And don't be deceived that good works or being part of the Christian family does not get anybody right or just with God. You may have been raised in the most, the most Christian family in the entire world, but that doesn't make you a Christian. A Christian is one who, by faith, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, calls upon his name and says, Jesus, save me.
when the message became clear, especially to these Jews, that all were sinners and all could become right with God only by faith, the Jews couldn't believe it. Aren't we God's favorite? Didn't he choose us from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and all the way through? Aren't we God's favorites? Aren't we his chosen nation? Has he broken his promises? And we'll see the Apostle Paul deal with those questions. We'll also see in verses, or in chapters 9 through 11, we'll see God's mercy and grace and offer of salvation to everyone, not just the Jews, to all. And in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 9, Paul's willingness, this is an incredible, it's, it's, it's an incredible statement, but Paul is willing to be accursed or separated from Christ for the Israeli people. Look at verse 1 with me. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named." That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will, shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and hadn't done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated." What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O Joel? Uh, Excuse me, you, O man. On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? We're going to just be looking at verses 1 through 5 today. And Paul starts out and says, Before Christ in my own my own Holy Spirit enlightened conscience, I'm speaking the truth. I'm not lying. When I say that my heart mourns, I'm pained and my grief and my anguish are unending. It doesn't stop. You see, Paul 
was a Jew too. He was an Israelite. He could trace his ancestry back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he knew how they felt toward Christ and toward Christianity. In fact, he calls himself the greatest of all sinners because he persecuted Jesus and the, and the church. He was on a mission to get rid of all Christians because he thought they were so wrong. And then Jesus met him and he said, Paul, why are you, why are you persecuting me? And Paul came to know him as Lord and the Jewish Christ. And so he understands their rejection. And their rejection of Jesus as Messiah causes him great grief. Because they were putting confidence in their flesh. Over in Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about, he says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And he gives all the list of the things that he had done in the flesh, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee, a separatist. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness or the justice which is in the law, found blameless. There was nothing that anybody could accuse Paul of in terms of keeping the law. And then he says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish or dung or manure and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness or justice of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes to, from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed, with, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. These Jews were putting all their confidence in their flesh. You know, their ans- I can trace my lineage back to so-and-so. My parents were, were, were good Jews, religious. Hey, I go to the temple and I offer sacrifices and I do this and I do that. I keep the law the best I can, at least better than some other people. Paul says, when I came to know the truth, the person of Jesus, all I had been counting on was dung, rubbish. Verse 3, my sorrow and grief go this far. If I could be accursed, the word there is anathema. If I could be separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my fellow Jews, I would do it. The Jerusalem Bible says, I would willingly be condemned and cut off from Christ if it would help my Israeli brothers. You know, this strikes me every time I read it. (laughs) I, I think, I hope, I would, and I think many of us would willingly give up the rest of our earthly lives if it meant some loved ones would be in glory too.
But I don't know about this. Or by we would be willing to separate it from Christ for all of eternity for the sake of my brothers, my fellow Jews. You see, I asked the question even on the bulletin, who, who, who can you think of for whom you would give up your own eternal presence with God? Or couldn't you think of anyone for whom you would give up your own eternal presence with God? Now, we realize that can't take place. We understand that, okay? We've just looked at nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. God is for us. There's nothing that could do that. He can't make this choice. He can't say, okay, I'm going to do this because he is he's this new creation in Christ. So we realize he can't do it, but he has this willingness to. And we need to sense the grief that Paul felt for those who didn't know the Lord. And are there those for whom we feel the same? And really you could ask the question, who has our Lord laid on your heart who need to know him? And that could be a, that could be a mate. That could be a parent. It could be a child. It could be a grandchild or a great-grandchild for people like Chuck Bonus. He's got them and counting. I mean, they're, you know. They're <laughs> but who has the Lord laid on your heart who need to know him? Be a neighbor. Could be a friend. Could be an enemy. And Paul goes on to show how God's mercy was displayed to his ancestors. And he lists eight things. Eight things that distinguish these descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Again. You're not a true Jew or an Israelite if you can't trace your lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You need to understand that. We're talking about a, an earthly lineage here. Most of us can't trace our lineage back to them. We're, we would be considered Gentiles or non-Jewish people. But these Israelites that God had chosen to be a nation, he tells them the eight things that distinguished these descendants. And he says, to you belongs the adoption as sons. It's really interesting that the only nation God ever called his son was Israel. To you belongs the glory. In other words, you enjoyed the physical, visible presence of God. There was a, you know, a cloud and fire. <laughs> there, was always, there was always this visible, uh, physical presence of God that was obvious to the people. Uh, to you belongs the, the covenants, these, these agreements that God made with Israel. There's the covenant that he made with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. And there was a covenant that he made with the nation. And there, there's a covenant that he made with King David. And of course, today we know that there's this new covenant that includes not only the Israelites, but it does include them, but it also includes the Gentiles. This new covenant that's available to any person. But that they were included with the new covenant. To you belongs the giving of the law, the Old Testament as a gift, God's written word. They, they received what was spoken and written by God himself. And they had that all through the Old Testament. 
To you belongs the service, the the privilege of rendering religious service and worship at the tabernacle and at the temple. To you belongs the promises made to these people. Remember the Abrahamic covenant, you know, he promised them land and seed and blessing. And later on, he also promised them the Messiah would come through the line. Salvation was a promise that was made to these people that if they would turn to the Lord, that by faith, a universal king that's talked about, it's promised to these people, the nation of Israel. Whose are the fathers? The fathers of the Jews were to refer to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, perhaps even Moses and David. And then he says the final thing there, that from the Israelites descended the Christ according to the flesh. This one that was promised in the Old Testament, this one that was prophesied in the Old Testament, there's coming this one, this wonderful consular, you know, this talked about that we just celebrated, (laughs) that we just celebrated at Christmas. The Christ came from the lineage of Israel. Jesus' humanity would have been through his Mother Mary. So the Messiah, Jesus, he came out of the nation of Israel. And then he describes this Christ, Christ who is over all, God blessed forever, Lord of all. Jesus is the supreme blessing, the supreme advantage. Amen. Let it be. And so in the bulletin, I say, what nation has had more sacred privileges than Israel? And yet they squandered them. But what have you done? What have I done with ours? What have we done with our blessings, privileges? You have the blessing of Jesus. You have the blessing of the Father. You have the blessing of the Spirit. You have the, the, we have the, the blessing of God's Word. We have this wonderful offer of salvation made to us. We have the new covenant. We have spiritual gifts and we have opportunities to serve. And what are we doing with those? We are a blessed people. The Jews were a blessed people. But we are a blessed people too. Now, if you're following along on, and I'd I'd like for you, even if you haven't been following along on this back-to-back handout, I'd like for you to turn to that. I want you to look at the second part of it. By the way, again, these are your identity and your walk and this new covenant. Uh, These are all included in those keys to discipleship. I I really do hope that you enjoy that. Come and join us. and um, It's a great, great time together. But this new covenant is built upon, just look at, the, look at it there, we're not going to go through all the, we're not going to go through the whole thing in detail. The new covenant is built upon a direct, intimate relationship with God, where sins are not an issue, nor is the law, nor is our flesh. Talk about liberating. And this is what happens when you when anyone by faith calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And I have put this in an acrostic and many of you have heard this and I hope you've memorized it. If you haven't, maybe today's, maybe this is your New Year's resolution. I'm going to memorize this and start thinking about it, meditating on it. I use that acrostic F-H-I-D-L-S, which I pronounce fiddles. So if you ever see fiddles, you know, F-I-D-D-L-S, that's not right. 
you need to realize this is the real, this is the biblical fiddles right here. And it's based upon all these verses, and I'm just going to read them so it'll be on the, uh, for those who are not following along, um, we're recording this. It's based on 1 Corinthians 11, 25, Luke chapter 22, verse 20, and that's where Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And then you have Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 18 through 22, and chapter 8, verses 6 through 12, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 through 18. And I encourage you to read those over to see that this is the biblical basis for this new covenant. And the first element that I, I include here is forgiveness of sins, the F in the F-H-I-D-L-S, stands for forgiveness of sins. God says, I will be merciful to your iniquities and remember your sins no more. And I know sometimes it's harder for us to forgive ourselves than than to accept this truth. We are to accept ourselves as forgiven Because this is what God himself states. You are forgiven. The second one, H, is your heart. H, heart made new. God says, listen to this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Joe and Sue have just shared that their, Joe's father just had some stints put in. He's already got a kind of a whole web of, of stints, but they added apparently a couple of more. But that's not what this heart made new is talking about. This is a heart transplant. This is a new heart. I will put a new heart and put a new spirit within you. The third one is I, that stands for an intimate relationship with God. God says, I will be your personal intimate God and you shall be my people. That we get to know him as father and he knows us as part of his family. That the Bible says we are his sons, we are his children, we are his heirs. This intimate relationship with God. The fourth thing, D, stands for direct access to God. It says in that Hebrews passage, it says, you won't need a priest or a teacher to get to know me, God says. You'll have direct access to me and knowledge of me. You won't need to go to Jerusalem or to a temple or offer a certain sacrifice. Jesus, is the, it ha, it, Jesus was the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. He never needs to go through it again. And he's our, he's our perfect high priest, and we go directly to and through him. The L stands for laws of God. My laws will be on your heart and on your mind, not on tablets of stone. He gives his own children hearts that long to obey. It's not an external motivation. You have to do this. That's what the Pharisees and the scribes were saying. You have to do this, and you can't do this, and you must. It it just, it was all do, do, don't, don't. It's not external motivation, it's internal. The reason that you long to obey, the reason that you want to pursue the Lord and grow in Him, is because God has given you a new heart that beats for Him. And I just want to say this. If you claim you're a Christian, but you don't have that kind of a heart, you need, to be, you need to go back and just make sure that you've come to know Jesus as Lord. You know, you, you, we join with Paul in, in Romans chapter 7. I want to do the will of God. I, I, I want to do the right thing. I don't want to do the wrong thing. I, I, I want to do the right thing. These laws being on our minds and hearts, they will continually motivate us to find everything we need in our Lord. And then the S, that's the last one here. S stands for Spirit of God. He says, I will place my spirit 
within you. The Holy Spirit, as, as you've grown in our Lord, we understand he's our helper and he's our strength and he's our encouragement and he's our comfort. And all six of these things here, every one of these takes place when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you believe in the person and work of Jesus and call upon his name. The Bible says you are saved, you are delivered, and these six things take place at that moment. And we need to live in light of these. We need to meditate upon these and say, wow, Holy Spirit, thanks for living within me. God, thank you for placing the law in, in, in my heart. That's the reason I long, I want to do the right thing here. I want to do things that are pleasing to you. And so at the bottom of this page, and I hope you put that in your Bible and keep it there, that new covenant, it's, that's my first thing that I wanted to share out of the four things I'm going to share over the next four weeks. But as we think about this, who, you know, on the bottom of the page there is reflecting on Romans 9, who are the ones you are praying for by name that they will come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? What opportunities is God giving you to speak to them about Jesus, his love and mercy, the new covenant? We had opportunities within our family to share the good news of Jesus over this Christmas. Great opportunities. How are you taking advantage of the opportunities that you're being given by the Lord? What have you done with the many blessings God has given you? And what are two practical ways you will use these verses in your own life? I'm going to pray, and then I would uh, ask that maybe two or three other people, more than that, that's fine, but uh, two or three people pray also. Father, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful truth of your word. I pray that we too are grieving over those that you brought into our lives who are lost. And I would pray that we would understand this good news to be able to share with them, you can be forgiven of all your sins. You can have this intimate relationship with God as your father. You can have permanent all the time access to him. No matter the situation, even when you've messed it up royally, you can have a new heart You can basically, spiritually, start life all over again. Yes, there may be consequences for the choices we made in the flesh, but but we can start life all over again. We can be born again. And thank you that you've laid your, your law on our hearts and on our minds, God, and may we share that with others. You won't have some this external code that you have to follow and try as hard as you can to follow. Instead, God's going to write them on your heart and on your mind. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and take up residence in your life, permanent. He'll never leave you. Always be there. You can count upon Him to be whatever you need in any situation, whether that is strength or comfort or encouragement. or It doesn't matter. He's going to be that. He's always there. So may we share all of the good news that the good news of Jesus, the gospel includes. And thank you for giving it to us and thank you for the people that you've laid on our hearts. I pray that we would, we would continue to pray for those people. But I also pray that we would be seeking opportunities because you'll give them to us. We'll take advantage of those to share this wonderful message of the Lord Jesus Christ. 